Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to class. Can I ask uh, Dave to lead us in prayer, please? Yeah, ma'am. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this time. We thank you for this day. We thank you that you are our God. Um, as we move in for our class, Lord Jesus, I pray that your favor and your grace be upon each one of us, Lord Jesus, as we learn from your word, have our man to speak the word in power and in authority, and help each one of us to understand it, Lord Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So uh, today we are looking at the last uh, chapter in Second Timothy, Second uh, Timothy chapter four. Um, last uh, Wednesday before we ended class, we read the entire chapter. Okay, so we'll just be looking at, uh, we'll be studying uh, the words, the phrases, or um, uh, we'll be studying the verses uh, in chapter four of Second uh, Timothy. Okay. Verses 1 and 2, can uh, one of you please read uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, please? In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, mm -hmm. rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Uh, thank you, Dave. So here we see that, you know, Paul's uh, in this uh, chapter it, or in this letter, it's Paul's final words to uh, his son in the faith, that is Timothy, who he left at Ephesus uh, to oversee the churches there at Ephesus and the, in the surrounding areas, uh, the seven churches as well. Uh, and we know that uh, Paul is now in Rome, he's imprisoned, and he knows that uh, he's going to uh, die soon. And so these are his last words uh, uh, to Timothy, though he would love to see Timothy in person, uh, but he knows it might not be a possibility or he's, he even thinks that it might be possible because he tells him to bring his cloak and things like that. Uh, but we see that does not happen because, uh, you know, soon after writing this letter, uh, he's martyred. Okay. So these are Paul's, uh, uh, Apostle Paul's final words uh, in verses 1 and 2 are very important because Paul is telling Timothy or he's giving him his charge. He's saying, uh, Timothy, here is my charge to you, or here is my final uh, uh, admonition to you, uh, my final charge to you, and this is really important. And I'm charging you before the Lord. So it's not just a polite uh, encouragement that he is giving, but it's a charge that he is giving. And this is something important. This is something serious. And uh, even as uh, uh, Paul is writing this charge to Timothy, he's saying that I'm doing it because I believe that God is watching me even as I uh, charge you. So what is he charging him or what is he wanting him to do? Uh, we see this in verse 2. He says, preach uh, the word, you know, and he's been telling him this uh, even as he wrote the first letter, uh, that is First Timothy. He says, preach the word, teach the word, uh, you know, stay focused on just preaching and teaching and not in, uh, you know, useless arguments uh, and uh, discussions. So he says, preach the word. Uh, and that is what, you know, all of us as uh, as people who are brought from uh, darkness into his marvelous light, uh, people who are his royal priesthood or holy nation, that is what God has called us to do. Uh, and that is our great commission. Uh, we need to preach, teach and baptize people in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Uh, so uh, here again, he's telling him and uh, giving him an important charge. He's saying, preach the word. Uh, and even as Paul is saying that to Timothy, it's something that we also need to um, 
you know, apply for our own lives, that we need to be people who are ready to preach the word of God. And he says, preach the word of God in season and out of season. You know, whether uh, it's convenient for you or inconvenient, whether the time is convenient or the time is inconvenient, whether it's easy or it's not easy, it says, preach uh, the word of uh, God. Okay. And uh, he says, as you preach the word of God, what are some of the things you need to do? Uh, the first thing he says is convince. Uh, that means, uh, convince means convict people or challenge them, uh, you know, uh, persuade them, encourage them, uh, basically persuade and encourage the hearts of the people, uh, you know, uh, to the truth, uh, to live according to the truth and to uh, follow the truth and then he says not only convince but he says also rebuke rebuke means lovingly correct them uh, bring correction in the lives of uh, the people uh, whether it's their personal lives family lives or whether it's regarding their walk with god their doctrine their uh, their hope their faith their trust in in god and then he says uh, exhort people that is uh, invite them encourage them motivate them inspire them uh, to live the truth to live their faith to walk in accordance uh, to what god has uh, asked them to do okay and he says you know preach people and when you preach you know uh, uh, convince rebuke and exhort and do it with all patience so when you're teaching be patient um, you know, uh, some people, sometimes people will get it, sometimes they will not get it, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, uh, we think that because they've heard it once, they don't need to hear uh, it again, but sometimes we need to repeat the same things again and again, teach the same things in different ways, uh, but when we do it, we need to be patient with people, patiently present the word of, uh, uh, the word of God, patiently present the truth to them uh, so that uh, you know uh, uh, and when we do this we also need to give people uh, the time to embrace the truth be patient with people to embrace the truth to live the truth and to walk in the truth okay so he goes on to write and say why should we be why should we teach patiently or why should we preach patiently or why should we be patient with uh, people uh, he goes on to write this in verses three and four can one of you please read verse three and four please what happened to the ladies in the class what happened to erin and uh, and um uh, kiran they didn't attend uh, the previous class no ma'am they did not <clears throat> okay Okay, so can somebody read the th verses 3 and 4, please? Okay, I'll read it, ma'am. Thank you, Dave. So the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what thing itching, what they itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myth. Thank you, Dave. So um, uh, Paul is saying that there will, be there will come a time when people will not endure sound doctrine. And of course, it was happening there uh, in Ephesus as well. People were not, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, living according to sound doctrine. They were heeding to all the false teachers, false teachers teaching that was going around um, and so we also see that the time and age that we are living in uh, you know um, people who want to just hear motivational messages they want to hear feel good uh, messages messages that make them feel happy uh, and they're not interested or they just want to shy away from sound teaching of the word they just want to hear messages that will always motivate them make them feel good make them feel happy uh, but not sound teaching or sound doctrines from the word of god um, it's good to give people uh, motivational messages uh, time and again but we also need to teach them sound doctrines from the word of uh, god and uh, people will flock 
to teachers or they've just run to people who preach or teach uh, what they want to listen, what uh, uh, pleases their ears, what pleases their uh, lifestyle, what pleases uh, uh, their mindset. Uh, and when they do this, you know, they slowly tend to wander away from the truth. And Paul says, you know, when they wander away from the truth, that's when uh, they will uh, follow myths, fables and man-made uh, stories. That means, uh, you know, people nowadays or people even in Paul's time, they want to replace the truth with uh, man-made fables and man-made stories because that is more exciting that is more interesting for them to um, learn so he's telling uh, Timothy you know it's important for you to keep teaching and preaching the word and don't keep uh, just talking about fables and stories uh, that, that uh, people want to hear which makes them feel uh, good which uh, you know kind of appeases their uh, taste buds okay now what is the danger uh, when uh, this happens is um, you know when people are just spoken to through motivational talk uh, to make feel uh, you know uh, talks that make them feel good make them feel very happy uh, they miss out on all that God seeks to do and to bring into our lives through his uh, word you know we know that God works through his word his word is powerful uh, we see that in the very beginning when he created the world uh, he spoke and everything came into existence. And ever since he has been speaking, he's been communicating to man, uh, his laws, his commandments, the rituals, uh, sacrifices, uh, how they need to live, where they need to go, how they need to dress, uh, every area, every aspect of the Lord, uh, uh, of their uh, of their life, you know, God has been, has communicated, he has spoken through leaders, prophets, judges, uh, through various people. Um, and so we see that, uh, you know, uh, God works by his words and there are so many things that uh, the God, word of God reveals or the scripture reveals to us that God's word does. Uh, so what are some of the things uh, we read in uh, John chapter 8 verses 31 and 32 that when we continue in the word, we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. Okay, uh, you know, the God's word is truth. Uh, even Jesus prayed this in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. He says, sanctify them by your truth. Uh, your, your word is truth. So God's word cleanses, sanctifies. Uh, it also sets us free. In Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 to 27, it says that when we hear, that only when we hear and do the word, then we have a solid a foundation it will be like a house that is built upon a, a rock and when the storm comes when the weather is really bad it will stand uh, the the fierceness of the storm or the fierce weathers because it is built on a strong foundation and what is a strong foundation strong foundation is that is the word of god when we hear it and when we do it okay we know that the word of god also sanctifies us john chapter 17 verse 3 it purifies us first peter chapter 1 verse 22 and 23 it builds us up acts chapter 20 and 32 and there are more um, aspects of the word of god the word of god uh you know uh, strengthens encourages rebukes uh, uh, trains us in righteousness and holiness uh, the word of god is the you know uh, the sword that we have uh, to come against every attack of the evil one the darts of the evil one every uh, temptation that we face so there's so much more about uh, what the word of god does and so he's saying you know you preach and teach the word of God. So even as, uh, you know, uh, 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 some of us uh, are involved in ministry, uh, we're preaching and teaching, it's very important that we don't sway, uh, you know, uh, towards uh, to keep our flock or just to have more people come to our church, that we just don't give motivational talks, uh, you know, feel good talks, uh, prosperity, just prosperity gospel all the time, because people would like to hear that. Uh, but we need to also teach them uh, things from the word of God, uh, also motivate them, also encourage them, also speak God's blessing and favor that comes as a result of keeping uh, his word. Okay. And then he goes on in verse five to tell uh, 
Timothy to stay focused. So um, in verse 5, he says, But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your uh, ministry. So he's telling Timothy, Timothy, don't get discouraged or don't get distracted by things that are around you. Uh, be watchful, be careful. He says, endure hardships. That means uh, you will face a lot of difficulties, a lot of difficult times, a lot of tough times. And he says, you know, you stand through. Don't shy away from your challenges, from your problems. And who uh, best to write to Timothy than Paul himself, who was in a very difficult situation, but somebody who's not running away, uh, from uh, his responsibilities, the challenges that he's facing. But even in this difficult situation, he is writing to people and he is encouraging them. He says, uh, keep proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. We know that we are in tough times, in difficult times. Uh, so we also need to continue proclaiming uh, the good news of uh, Jesus Christ. And then he says, complete your ministry okay complete the assignment that god has uh, given to you and then he goes on in verses six to eight to talk about his own journey so can one of you please read verses six to eight please can i read sure kanan thank you yeah for i'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will uh, give to me on the day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Thank you. So Paul is here very aware that uh, he would be martyred soon. Uh, he would die soon. Um, and he says his life is being offered up for the sake of the gospel. Uh, but in spite of uh, what he is going to face, uh, though it's troubling, though it's difficult, uh, uh, it can be very, uh, it can fill him with anxiety. But there is a deep sense of accomplishment. Uh, and why do we say that there's a deep sense of accomplishment? Because he says, I have fought a good fight. And there's a deep sense of completion because he says he has finished the race. Uh, there's also a deep sense of fulfillment because he says he has kept the faith. And then uh, there is uh, uh, expectation or hope uh, that he's looking up or he's looking ahead uh, and he's saying that there is a crown laid up for me. So when he says that he's fought a good fight, he basically says, you know, I've uh, accomplished what I had to. He's finished the race. He's completed what uh, God has purpose for him. There's a sense of completion. There's a sense of fulfillment. He has kept the faith. He has not... Uh, you know, turn back on God. He has not deserted his faith like uh, like some people have gone back uh, to the worldly ways. And then he says, you know, he's expecting a crown uh, that is laid up for him. And then he tells Timothy uh, to come quickly to him in verses 9 to 11. Uh, can one of you please read verses 9 to 11, please? I'll read now. Thank you, Thomas. Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for the Thessalonica. Circes for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. And Titus I have sent to Ephesus. Bring the clock that I left with the Carpus that drew us when you came, and the books, especially the uh, parchments. Parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. 
Yeah. Thank you, uh, Thomas. So here, um, Paul is telling Timothy, uh, you know, uh, and asking him uh, to be uh, to come to him quickly. And he says, "Be diligent, be sincere, be faithful." And says, uh, "Come to see me quickly because I have not much time. Uh, you know, because I'll be dying soon, I'll be martyred soon. Uh, come quickly to see me." And uh, we see that Paul long is longing to see Timothy. Um, uh, and uh, and he also long he's longing to see Timothy because uh, the others have left him, uh, and only Luke is there with um, Paul. Okay, uh, and he says Demas has forsaken me. So we see, uh, you know, uh, Demas was a fellow worker uh, of Paul. Uh, he's mentioned in Colossians chapter four, uh, verse fourteen, and Philemon chapter one, verse twenty-four. Um, you know, so we know that uh, he was uh, ministering with Paul, so he must have uh, traveled with Paul, he must have uh, uh, seen uh, Paul ministering, uh, he, he would have also seen how God is, uh, uh, has been using uh, uh, Paul mightily to minister to people, uh, and uh, he just observed, also must have observed Paul's life very, very uh, closely. But the sad thing is that, uh, you know, Demas has now forsaken Paul uh, and the work of the kingdom uh, because he is drawn uh, to the things of the world. Okay, so we can say how sad, uh, you know, for Demas to have done that. But, uh, you know, this is something that we need to also uh, take note of. Uh, this is also a warning for us uh, that we need to be on our God, each one of us, okay? Uh, we might be strong in the faith. Uh, we might be serving God. We might be also studying in the Bible college. I might also be teaching in the Bible college. Uh, but, you know, um, you know, we uh, can we can also come to a place uh, where we can abandon our faith, abandon our life assignment that God has for us, uh, abandon the purposes and the plans for God. Uh, we can even deny him and we can also be, we can be drawn to the things of the world. Okay. Uh, that can come in so subtly without us even knowing uh, we can give up everything and we can go uh, follow the things of this world, uh, please our own carnal natures, uh, desire the, the lust of the eyes, the, flesh, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Uh, we can get so entangled with the things of the world that we can lose focus of uh, our relationship with God, our fellowship with God, uh, what God has called us to do, what he has portioned us and purposed us for to do. And we can come to a place that we can even abandon our life assignment uh, just for uh, the things of this uh, world. Okay. So it was sad what de happened to Demas, but we need to also be on our guard. And that is why the word of God says that we need to work out our salvation da daily with, sorry, we need to work out our salvation daily with fear and uh, trembling. Uh, we do not know what happened to Demas. Um, uh, but we see that he has not only abandoned Paul because he was in chains, he was scared that he might be uh, imprisoned, uh, but we also see that he abandoned his faith uh, and he has uh, was drawn to the things of this world. Okay, um, It's interesting to also see here that uh, Paul talks about, uh, you know, uh, John Paul. Okay. Um, he says... Uh, Sorry, not John Paul. John Paul is one of the students. It's John Mark. Okay, so he says, um, uh, you know, uh, Luke is with him and he says, get Mark and bring him with you for he is useful for me uh, for ministry. Okay, now, uh, 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 
John Mark is uh, or Mark here is his other name is John Mark. He is the he is the nephew of uh, Barnabas, and we know that Paul and Barnabas uh, they traveled on their first missionary journey, um, and they went uh, to, together to different places to preach and to teach uh, the word of God. And we see that when they were on the first missionary journey, Barnabas took along with him his nephew, John Mark. And Paul, Barnabas, and John Mark, uh, they left to Antioch. And then they went from Antioch, they ministered in Antioch, then they went to the seaport of, uh, uh, in the town of Caesarea. Uh, and they ministered there as well. And from Caesarea, they traveled to Cyprus. And uh, they came to uh, the east coast of Cyprus. And then they went all around to the west coast and when they reached the west coast of cyprus uh, you know maybe john mark was tired uh, tired of uh, uh, traveling maybe tired of uh, being a missionary uh, he, maybe he did he just wanted to go back home must be homesick whatever but he decides to um, leave uh, Barnabas and Paul and go back home. And uh, Paul, you know, did not take that too well. He did not forget that. He was uh, maybe very upset. Uh, maybe he thought, uh, you know, John Mark does not have a good commitment or passion to ser serve God or ministry or uh, whatever. Uh, we do not know. Uh, but we see that uh, when Paul wanted to go on his second missionary journey and he wanted to take his good companion along with him, that is Barnabas, uh, Barnabas wanted John Mark, his nephew, to accompany them on their second missionary journey. And Paul was totally uh, against it. And this led to uh, a strong argument between Paul and Barnabas uh, or, a, or a strong disagreement between um, uh, Paul and Barnabas. It was so strong, uh, their disagreement, that Barnabas decided not to go with Paul on his second missionary journey. So they split. And uh, Barnabas takes John Mark and they go to their hometown. Uh, and we see that Paul... Uh, takes Silas and he goes to Antioch and then travels to other places to um, minister. But later on, we see that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Paul would have heard about John Mark, uh, his ministry, uh, how well he's doing from, uh, 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 you know, Paul's other co-workers, uh, other believers. And so now things have changed. And uh, we see that uh, Paul uh, uh, wants Timothy to bring John Mark. And he tells him that, uh, you know, um, because uh, he's useful for uh, Paul in his ministry. So at one point of time, uh, Paul thought when he's going to his second missionary journey that John Mark was is not going to be useful. Uh, he's not going to be an asset. He's not going to be of any help. But uh, things have changed. Times have changed. We do not know if John Mark itself uh, change his perspective to missions, to serving God. Uh, he would have learned, he would have grown, and uh, he's doing a wonderful work in the ministry, or Barnabas would have trained uh, John Mark. We do not know any of those things. We're just speculating. Um, but we see there has been a tremendous change because uh, Paul is telling Timothy to bring John Mark along with him. Okay, So there is something here that we can learn. Uh, you know, when uh, people come alongside to work, to support us in the ministry, or people who are part of the church, or people who are part of uh, a group, a Bible study group, uh, we can see sometimes they are, uh, you know, uh, we don't see that kind of passion or commitment. Uh, we see a kind of spiritual lethargy as well, laziness to the things of God. Uh, there's no uh, discipline when it comes to the things of God. And we can write off people and say they are no good, they are of no use. Uh, you know, we can write off uh, people, we can write off people groups, um, but that's not something that we should really do. Um, you know, and we should not hold people's past against them. Uh, it is so redeeming uh, when people, uh, uh, you know, don't look at our past. We all had have had a past. 
a not so good past. Uh, a past is made up of good things, bad things. But just imagine if people are constantly pointing out to our failures, uh, to the to the bad things that we did, the naughty things that we did as children or when teenage time or in our youth days. Uh, and they don't overlook that. They don't look at how we've changed, how God has redeemed us, how God is using us now, how God is building us. You know, uh, what God has done from the time that uh, uh, we were in that uh, kind of uh, you know, spiritual lethargy or dullness or lack of uh, uh, commitment or in our sinful state. Um, but, you know, how God has redeemed us and where we are now, where God has established us, where God has brought us to. Um, so we see that, you know, Paul himself, uh, uh, as a great apostle, is able to acknowledge um, and uh, identify that there has been a change in John Mark and that you know, he's useful for the ministry. So even in our ministry, you know, people would have had a past, but uh, we look at, uh, we, you know, we don't keep going back to their past. Look at how God has uh, transformed them, changed them uh, to who they are in the present, uh, you know, work alongside them, build them up, encourage them up, uh, encourage them, and also utilize their skills the expertise, uh, the areas where God has built them up uh, in your ministry uh, so that they can be of good use to you. So we need to learn uh, to do this with people, even with people group. And who better than Paul to say this? Because Paul himself had a past as a persecutor, as one who was uh, uh, persecuting and, uh, you know, uh, 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 attesting to people to be killed, Christians to be martyred. And uh, there was a huge transformation when he had an encounter with uh, Jesus on the road to uh, Damascus. And so we see that Paul uh, is uh, somebody who lives with his who, who has had a past, but people have accepted him. And we see that he's also been somebody who overlooks people's past and sees them for who God has trans transformed them to be now in the present and how he can use them uh, for the extension and the building of God's kingdom. Okay. Uh, then he, Paul talks about uh, some matters at Ephesus in verses 12 uh, to 15. Um, um, you know, he Paul requests uh, for his cloak uh, because it's uh, winter is going to be approaching. It's going to be very cold. So he asks for his cloak and uh, 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 books as well. Uh, you know, it's most likely that when Paul was uh, arrested at Taurus, uh, which resulted in his second imprisonment at Rome, uh, in those days, uh, the the soldiers who were arresting a person would who ha would have a claim on their extra garments. So, if the person who's been arrested had some extra clothes or garments, uh, you know, the soldiers would take it away from them, uh, and um, and they would arrest them with just you know one pair of clothes that is on uh, them and extra anything extra they the soldiers would take it away. Now uh, Paul would have been forewarned that uh, he's going to be arrested. Um, and therefore, he left his uh, cloak uh, and his few books. Uh, his cloak is his outer garment uh, and a few books that he had uh, with a very honest man named uh, Carpus. Uh, and we see that he wants them back now so that, uh, uh, you know, he can keep himself warm uh, as winter is approaching. We also see that Paula, uh, Paul stayed as a scholar to the very end. Uh, we know that uh, he was uh, uh, a well-learned man. He studied under uh, the great teacher Gamaliel and others as well. He knew the Old Testament Torah. Uh, he knew the Old Testament very well. And so we see that uh, he wanted to remain uh, to study even as he had time in prison. Um, so he wanted his books back, especially he wanted the parchments, uh, which were portions of the Old Testament so that he can uh, study it. And then Paul also wants Timothy uh, to stay away from uh, Alexander, who is a 
who's the coppersmith. Uh, Alexander was uh, known to make trouble for Paul. Uh, he's also, Paul mentions about him in First Timothy chapter 1, verse 20. Uh, and uh, he, there he tells that Alexander is someone whose faith has been shipwrecked or whose faith had suffered shipwreck. And now Paul is warning Timothy about the same man. Um, he's, uh, Paul simply wrote that Alexander did me much harm. Uh, but uh, he's writing to Timothy and saying that now he would oppose you, Timothy, so you must uh, beware of him. So basically, I think uh, Alexander was somebody who was opposing those who were leaders of the churches, those who were uh, Paul's uh, close uh, 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 companions, those who Paul has, uh, you know, assigned work in different places. So he's somebody who is uh, kind of causing much harm, not only to Paul, but also Paul is telling him now that he would oppose Timothy. So says, be aware of him. Okay, uh, the phrase here that in, uh, that he informed many things against me is maybe, you know, Alexander must have been a traitor uh, and an informer who betrayed Paul and maybe, uh, you know, spoken about him to the uh, Roman government. And as a result of that, uh, his, uh, in his current imprisonment, you know, maybe because of that, he is in, uh, in prison now. Um, and perhaps the thought that uh, he has greatly resisted our words, uh, which Paul writes, uh, means that Alexander was witness against Paul at his first defense. Remember his first Roman imprisonment where Paul was under house arrest, where he writes uh, First Timothy. Uh, so we see that uh, during his first um, imprisonment, uh, and when Paul was taken before Nero, we see that uh, Alexander was standing as a witness against uh, um, Paul in his first defense. So Paul is saying, when he did it to me, he can do that to you as well, Timothy. So just be careful of that man, be aware of him. Okay. Then Paul goes on to write in verses 16 to 18 that no one uh, stood with him. Uh, can one of you read that verses, please? Verses 16 to 18. At my first defense, defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Uh, so here Paul shares about his uh, uh, first trial uh, that took place two years prior to his now second Roman imprisonment. Um, and in his first Roman imprisonment, we know that he was under house arrest and he was put uh, and he had to wait for his trial. And he was his trial was before Nero. And uh, we know that when uh, when Paul was in his first imprisonment, as well as in his second imprisonment, uh, many of his fellow workers forsook him. Uh, they did not want to be identified with him. The whole fact that they also will be put into prison, they will also be imprisoned, um, and they would also maybe, uh, you know, killed or martyred. Um, but we see here that in spite of uh, Paul's uh, companions or uh, his co-workers, you know, kind of forsaking him uh, but we see that there is no grievances that Paul holds against them uh, even during this time of hardship there is no anger against them uh, that is something very amazing uh, that is something that we also need to uh, keep in mind you know uh, even when uh, we are serving God or even as we are living our lives our day to day lives there will be people who uh, will be a hindrance to us people who will be uh, speak negative of us people will kind of be a problem to us uh, cause a confusion or report about us to higher authorities uh, and uh, cause a lot of uh, 
uh, you know, problems for us. But uh, like Paul, you know, we should not hold it against them, uh, not hold any resentment, hatred, bitterness at, at any time against people who do this to us. Um, but Paul says here that, um, you know, when he was all alone, there was nobody with him. Uh, there was God who delivered him uh, from being sentenced to death. During his first Roman imprisonment, uh, he was he felt very lonely uh, because everyone forsook him. He was all alone standing there in front of Nero. Uh, he knows that he might face death, but he says the Lord stood with him. The Lord helped him. The Lord delivered him from being sentenced to uh, death. And Paul says that he used this opportunity. Okay, just imagine in this opportunity he used when he was facing trial before Nero uh, and he was, you no, know, he knew that he could be sentenced to death, but he uses that opportunity uh, to share the gospel with, uh, you know, uh, with those in the courtroom to share the Gentiles with, the, to share the gospel, sorry, with the Gentiles, uh, with the Romans. Maybe these Gentiles and Romans have never heard uh, the news of Jesus Christ uh, and what uh, place uh, he uses a courtroom uh, to share the gospel uh, with all of them. And even Nero would have heard uh, the gospel. Okay. And, uh, you know, these, these men, these officials, these Roman officials, soldiers, uh, uh, these Gentiles were all there to, you know, uh, to, he to hear uh, Paul or to s hear the court verdict against him, you know, um, uh, would not have had a better opportunity elsewhere to receive or hear the good news. And Paul makes use of that place. He makes use of the courtroom uh, to share the gospel, even as he's uh, standing in trial before um, Nero. And Paul is saying that the same God, the same Lord who uh, stood beside him in his first Roman imprisonment, even as he was, even as he was facing trial, uh, he has the confidence that the same Lord would deliver him from every evil work and preserve him for his eternal kingdom. Okay. He knows that this time he might not um, get free or be set free, uh, but he's, uh, he has this confidence that God will deliver him from the every evil work and preserve him for his eternal uh, kingdom, okay? So the emphasis here is not that, uh, you know, Paul will not suffer or he will not be persecuted or he will even not be killed. Uh, Paul was already uh, going through it. He was suffering persecution, hardship, difficulties, uh, and acknowledge that his life was being poured out uh, as a drink offering, as a sacrifice, as we saw in verse 6. Uh, and he declares that anything evil that is designed to rob him of his eternal destination will not succeed, but God will preserve him for his eternal kingdom. Okay. Uh, in the same way, you know, even as we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one for thine is the kingdom. Uh, this does not mean that we will not face uh, temptation. This does not mean that we will not face persecution. Uh, Jesus said that, uh, you know, we will be persecuted. We will uh, face difficulties. Um, but, you know, as we pray, we need to pray for God's strength to help us uh, to overcome uh, temptation, overcome every attack of the evil one, be on our guard, uh, be ready with uh, the armor of God. Uh, and also that, you know, uh, uh, nothing and we, we need to be ready for any persecution that comes our way, uh, uh, knowing that, you know, nothing evil will prevail against us uh, and God would give us the strength to overcome or to even go through those sufferings, those persecutions that we uh, face. And then he says, to him be glory forever and uh, ever. Uh, it just, uh, you know, reflects uh, uh, how optimistic and joyous Paul is. It's so unreasonable, uh, but he's so optimistic about, uh, uh, you know, the 
crown of life that he is going to receive, the future hope that he has, the eternal uh, destination that he has. Um, and this has filled him with a lot of optimism and joy. Um, uh, we know that, you know, the last few days of his life, Paul spent his life um, penniless, penniless, uh, you know, penniless, uh, friendless, uh, without any uh, valuable possessions. He was cold. He did not have even enough clothes to cover himself, to keep himself uh, warm, no adequate clothing, and he was destined to, to die soon. But in spite of all that, he is just breaking out in praise and glory uh, to God because he has this great uh, hope which is filling him with a lot of optimism and with a lot of joy uh, that there is a heavenly reward waiting for him. Okay. And then he uh, ends uh, his letter, his final letter to Paul uh, with uh, greetings. Uh, he says uh, in verse 19, greet Prisca and Aquila. Prisca is basically Priscilla and Aquila, the couple uh, that... Uh, were good co-workers, good companions uh, of Paul. And he, uh, Timothy, uh, Paul tells Timothy to also uh, convey his greetings to the household of Onesiphorus. Okay. Um, so we know that Aquila and Priscilla, uh, you know, Priscilla is the wife, but here it's written as Prisca. So Priscilla and Aquila uh, were Paul's uh, teammates, co-workers, uh, good friends who served along with him in Corinth. Uh, this couple were basically from Rome, but when persecution broke out against Christians in Rome uh, because of uh, Emperor Nero, uh, they came to Corinth and they joined uh, Paul at Corinth. We read about this in uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 2. Also, Romans chapter 16, verse 3. And uh, along with Paul, they did the work at Corinth. They established the church at Corinth. Then they moved with Paul to Ephesus. Uh, and we see that, uh, you know, they helped Paul in his work at Ephesus. They uh, also helped in building up the church at Ephesus. And uh, they trained, um, a, uh, as a couple, they trained Apollos, Apollos, uh, who they sent to Corinth to continue the work there, to see the oversee the church there. And so, uh, you know, Paul is very grateful for uh, all that they have done. He's reminded uh, of uh, uh, their work in the Lord. They, he's reminded about uh, how they were good co-workers, good companions, um, good friends uh, with Paul who ministered along with him uh, uh, in the furtherance of the, of the gospel in building the kingdom of God. And uh, he does not want to miss the opportunity to send his greetings and thank them for what uh, uh, they have done, um, you know, uh, for him and also uh, in ministering and in building the kingdom of God. Okay. Uh, it's 10.50. It's time for our break now. We will take a break and uh, we will come and uh, complete the rest of these verses in this chapter uh, uh, after break. Okay.